Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and uh, today I wanted to do a little bit of a, a trip down another Booker Prize long-listed book. Where does he keep getting this idea from? Where is, where is this going? Um, anyway, so the book I would like to talk about is An Island by Karen Jennings. So recently um, I did a chat with Sean um, over at Sean the Book Maniac about the other South African writer shortlisted, um, for, uh, long-listed rather, um, in this year's Booker Prize uh, for you know, with Damon Galgut for The Promise. And th today I wanted to talk a little bit about An Island by Karen Jennings. Now this book, um, is it sort of should be said is from a much smaller press and so there's been this really interesting sort of thing for Karen Jennings uh, where essentially she you know this book had something like 10 reviews on Goodreads uh, before the long list announcement and then suddenly everyone sort of flopped to go and get the book and <laughs> what sort of happened in the process is it sort of you know, the, the publishers sort of just thought like, oh, crikey, <laughs> like, and had to sort of rush out loads and loads more copies. So, um, and apparently Karen Jennings herself hasn't even seen a, a sort of physical copy of her book yet. It's been that kind of much of a whirlwind, um, partly because of COVID, partly because of various other things. But um, yeah, and so it's really exciting to see um, this book on the long list, and particularly to see a book from a smaller press anyway. And um, it doesn't happen as often as probably it would be good to have uh, but you know something like Duck's Newburyport um <laughs> he's mentioning it again um something like Duck's Newburyport you know by from Galley Beggar Press um who are a wonderful wonderful press uh they um also are kind of a press that doesn't you know that they were also another kind of sort of success story of a smaller press getting onto the long list and the short list and it's so exciting to see this happen I, I think it it you know, being on a prize long list or short list or winning one um, for any prize, I think, can really transform the um, the sort of fortunes of a writer. Um, you know, for some for some smaller writers, especially that um, you know, sort of writers with with sort of fewer works out or kind of with with lower sales, it can completely transform it. I mean who knew about this book before it came out and before it, uh, sorry, before it got longlisted. Um, a book like Shuggy Bane last year, um, apparently, you know, sort of being released during the time of COVID um, had sort of been sort of somewhat under the radar. People who had read it had loved it. And it was sort of a, a very sort of slow growing sort of sleeper cult hit. And then it was longlisted, then it was shortlisted, then it won. And in that time, in that sort of relatively short window of a few months, the book absolutely skyrocketed and, and sort of has become a bestseller. And, you know, it, it it's it sort of quite rightly reached a whole new audience um, and so I'm really hoping that happens for uh, for Karen Jennings too that she she really gets a lot more um, of a readership and kind of uh, and, and everything from that anyway the book itself so this book is all about this uh, this man Samuel who lives on an island um, hence the title of the book um, and on this island he is sort of somewhat remote uh, from everybody else. It's basically just him on this island. He's sort of got his routines and his the things he does to um, kind of stay focused, do what he needs to. You know, there are people who come in from um, other islands um, or from sort of the nearby mainland to give supplies, you know, sort of like the, the chicken feed that he needs for his, for his chickens and um, sort of generally the kind of infrastructure around all the basic things he might need. But he is alone for, for most of the time on this island. Suddenly there is, uh, and this is sort of the, the kind of turning point, the kind of crux of this book, is a man washes up on shore. And there's this really fascinating scene where um, essentially the um, he sort of is talking about uh, reporting this and sort of saying, well, you know, actually someone's just uh, washed up, what do I do? And one of the first questions that's sort of asked um, um, in these sorts of scenarios, it seems to be uh, that he sort of, at least that he recounts, is this idea of, well, actually describe this person, are they darker than you? And that's a really sort of startling thing because although it seems at first to just be a sort of description to sort of plot where he is sort of in a, you know, what he looks like, that obviously sh also shouldn't matter for someone washing up on um, on the shore. And we sort of learn a few more details throughout the book as it goes that, you know, there have been uh, refugee ships that have um, capsized recently and sort of to be out, you know, be on the lookout for them. So this book really engages um, in quite a subtle sort of distant way with a wider political discussion around um, 
around migration, around immigration, and particularly refugees. And, and you know, we've sort of seen, particularly the last few years, um, a real crisis in terms of so many refugees um, fleeing certain countries and sort of certain areas, whether due to war or, or kind of various other um, sort of political and, uh, and sort of situations and how some countries have sort of taken people in with with open arms and been really supportive and, and open and others have not been and you know there have been I'm ashamed to say in my own country of the UK there have been news reports of sort of people being quite gleeful in sort of discussing things about you know shooting down refugee ships or how um the the various sort of uh, protective agencies that we've got that kind of monitor the seas and make sure that everybody's safe, how those agencies shouldn't be um, saving the lives of refugee boats that are capsizing. And these discussions have been happening and it's grim and it's disgusting and it, it makes me deeply uncomfortable and deeply ashamed of, of my nation you know, that, that people would think that. Um, it, it's barbaric. But anyway, this book engages with that in kind of quite an interesting, subtle way. And interestingly, we see this as well in um, in the other South African book on this long list, uh, Damon Galgut's The Promise. We see this idea of taking um, a political situation and a sort of big sort of political moment and making it over there. Uh, it kind of happened. It, it was all sort of taking place off stage almost. And instead, we get the kind of microcosm of the day to day interactions that might reinforce or might kind of um, exemplify that in some ways right and so the refugee crisis is a is a big big topic and here it's sort of distilled down into one or two as we'll find out later in the book bodies um and this is the point where i should say that we are going to go into spoiler territory so by all means if you haven't read the book and um intend to and don't want spoilers perhaps come back to this later um but we get this the body of this man washing up now um on shore and initially there is a real conversation essentially around these two characters and sort of trying to see how they're going to live together on this island um it's sort of they kind of both sort of seem to try and reach out to connect to each other and and also sort of take a lot of time Kind of apart from each other and there's a sort of strong sense of distrust at least that we get from samuel himself um and that that kind of distrust plays again into that national narrative of um when often when people speak about refugees um as exemplified by a certain former u.s president it's it's spoken about in a way that is as if every single person trying to flee one country to go to another is not only kind of feckless and um, and below the people of the nation that they're going to, but also that they actively seek them harm. And that distrust um, is sort of bound up with such a strong sense of nationalism. And although, as far as I'm aware, in an island, I don't think we ever really get a sense of what country it's meant to be linked to, if I'm right. I don't. I think it kind of, this island almost operates in a sort of nationless way for the most part, as far as I'm aware, unless there are very specific references I missed. But what is really interesting about that is, is it still feels like it plays into some of those, or it still dissects some of those same narratives. And those narratives are really damaging ones about the idea of of someone come kind of coming to to you know over to kind of cause you harm then this book starts really ramping it up and we get something really interesting taking place where the book shifts into us we, we, occasionally we, we kind of get these flashbacks of samuel and at first it's quite difficult to to work out what's going on because i think Suddenly we're talking about, you know, at first we're talking about the island being empty apart from Samuel and, and this this other man who's washed up. And then we get this other sort of, we get these flashbacks that contain multiple other characters being on the island. And it starts, we start realising that this character, Samuel, is going back and forth between the sort of real life present day and flashbacks and delusions and past traumas. And it's really quite difficult to read at times because it is confusing and um uh i was chatting about this book um with um eric carl anderson over at lonesome reader um and i'm gonna sort of shamelessly steal what he said here because it was really interesting which is is that, that the idea that 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 essentially mirrors that that kind of inner trauma right that there is 
at first it's, it feels quite unreadable and, and sort of difficult. And then you realise that actually that's sort of the form meeting the purpose of the of the novel, right? That the novel is trying to talk about um, this sort of broken sense of memory and time and place caused by trauma. And actually, the 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 narrative really reflects that. We get a really a really strong balance of of shifting between one narrative to another. And as a result, we see that this character's thought patterns are really quite scattered and um, difficult, and he's finding it really hard to, to sort of focus. And as we go on, we learn a little bit more about what some of those traumas are. There's this story of a lost son. There is a story of him being in prison and having this really horrendous time. You know, it, it's kind of torture. It's um, sort of mental warfare. And... All of those things again sort of contribute to this picture then that we see of this man who is uh sort of who, whose thought patterns are so broken and difficult and, and he can't really stay on track as i'm not really doing as i'm doing really kind of trying to describe this book but it's so interesting because once you sort of get into that and kind of follow through with it and i will admit there was a bit early on in this book where i was sort of I don't think I was necessarily taking into too much. I think it was, I was finding it a bit too scattered. And I think it, it eventually, I think you, you do fall into the rhythm of it. Um, but it, it does sort of make you work for that a little bit, I think. Then once you're into this rhythm, you hear about all this sort of backstory and it doesn't excuse his behavior, but it does start to shed some light on what is happening. And it all leads up towards this, this end that suddenly out of nowhere, I'm not necessarily out of nowhere. You kind of, in some ways, fear it, it's coming but this very brutal moment at the end where he attacks this man um, and in the meantime we have had a second body wash up on shore and this woman um, who is is on the shore has her throat slit and there is this scene where where this this man and he's never given a name by the way he's always just the man um, the man who had washed up previously on shore and had sort of been in a bad way he um, he kind of, in the middle of the night, comes up to Samuel and makes a sort of throat-slitting gesture. And at first, Samuel takes this as a threat. And again, this is really interesting that it's, you know, his, his sort of first thing is that this man obviously means him harm. Then later, he thinks that this man is maybe confessing to having slit this woman's throat. But actually, it's always left, as far as I'm aware, um, at least, left fairly open about whether actually this man has done this to this 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 woman's body or whether um actually the woman perhaps washed up on shore with her throat slit um or or you know so many other kind of complicating factors and so it's interesting that we kind of essentially get that thought pattern of someone who's really distrustful of foreigners and you know there's no kind of clearer way in some ways of painting an idea of a foreigner than here is my island <laughs> and here is somebody who's come to my island and that kind of again microcosm of a much broader picture i thought was really interestingly handled particularly when we get the violence later, because there, there have been a few tender moments between these two men. Samuel, at one point, has sort of covered for this man and, and made, you know, helped him hide while other people are on the island because they know that refugees have been recently appearing on shores of, of various sort of areas nearby, and everyone's been told to look out for it. There's a, a YouTube video that, um, well, a, a video that, that Samuel is sort of shown um, and we also sort of shown Samuel as this man of, who can't really use tech. So he sort of is given this phone and sort of just told to press the triangle in the middle to make it play. And he watches this sort of video news report about refugees. And he sort of realises his own sort of role. He's somewhat complicit because he's hiding some, well, because there's someone on his island. And he kind of is sort of saying, well, yeah, OK, I'll let someone know if it takes place. Um, and he, he sort of does at one point help this man hide and sort of then tries to support him. But it becomes really interesting and thorny when we get to the end where there's this brutal moment of him attacking this man. And there is a line that I really want to share with you because I just think this is so, so powerfully done. And I think this line really sums up some of those key themes and some of the power in this ending of the book. Samuel forgot the comfort of company and help. He forgot his yearning for Leslie, for a son with whom to share his island. 
None of that mattered now. All things within him that had been cowardly turned towards rage. That old call to violence, the call he had never fully believed in, never fully embraced, was growing strong within him. And I just think that's that's such a great, powerful line. I mean, this is literally about a page away from the end of the book. And that line, I think, sort of sums it up. This idea of kind of cowardice turning to rage, that he has been sort of so under the thumb of people throughout his life that he cannot that, that it, it's kind of all been pressed down so so much that it just erupts as rage and again this is not to excuse his actions what he does is vile and, and horrific but it's so interesting as an exploration of that of, of what not only things like the refugee crisis do uh, you know can, can do but also the effects of war and the effects of trauma that so much has been pushed down for so long he has not really been given the support he's needed and he he kind of reacts in this really violent way that he that's the only way he seems to know how to deal with this situation and it's ultimately just such a bleak sort of ending essentially and the book pretty much stops there we don't really get a sense of what the the repercussions are we don't know if he is ever caught for this crime we don't know if um if he sort of lives a happy existence afterwards or whether this further amplifies all of his traumas we don't know if um other people come to the island and discover what has happened we don't know any of that and in some ways that's what's so wonderfully powerful and heartbreaking about this book and i think as a result that's i i sort of Midway through the book, I wasn't necessarily seeing why this book had made the long list, but I think as we edge towards the end of this book, and it really flows by, this is quite a quick read um, in many ways, and it's only about 170, 180 pages, and it, it does go by pretty quickly. I kind of get it, because once you get to the end of this book, it it's such a sudden abrupt and powerful ending that I think it, 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 I can imagine sort of it lingering in people's minds quite a lot afterwards, which is useful when you're up against 150 other books in a long list. Um, regardless, I think this is just a, a really interesting book. I think, you know, I, I it's not sort of perfect. I think there are some issues I had sort of early on, um, at least with how the book signposts to you that we're shifting narratives. Um, I don't think it always does it that clearly, but in some ways, again, sort of like like Eric was saying, I don't know if, I, I think in some ways that's the point, right? That he has these thoughts that are so intrusive that it is almost like um, it will sort of shift paragraph by paragraph. And that is actually, I would imagine, probably somewhat closer to how um, intrusive thoughts from trauma would would kind of affect somebody as opposed to um kind of neatly ord ordered and now i'm going into my trauma mode you know it's it, it doesn't sort of work like that um so i think this book is really interesting i can totally see why it's not everybody's cup of tea and i again sort of had some problems with how the book starts off and how the book um deals with with some bits in the middle i felt like it was a bit uh some bits that I, I I don't know if I necessarily got too too much from it but I think overall it comes together to this end point that is so powerful and and, and thought-provoking um that I think it will stay in your mind a little bit after you've read it um so that has been An Island by Karen Jennings um I'd love to hear your thoughts um uh and um if yeah how you've sort of found it so far if you've got any other books on a kind of similar theme i'd be really interested because this is something i quite like not only sort of in plays um but in other books where there's a really um controlled setting essentially where characters don't really leave they're sort of bottlenecked into this one place and as a result everything is sort of possible but sort of not everything is possible at the same time um and I, I love those kinds of tight narratives for that. Um, so if you have any other recommendations on that, please pop them in the comments below. Um, regardless, I've been Bob. Uh, this has been An Island by Karen Jennings. Uh, and take care, and I hope you enjoy your reading. Bye-bye.